today I want to talk to you about visionaries. You might very well ask why. Why should we talk about visionaries? Visionaries are fun. Visionaries are exciting. Visionaries do amazing things. They bring us new technology. They bring us new products. They bring us new art. They bring us music. They change the world. We need visionaries. We need more visionaries. So when I travel, I often look for visionaries. And if you'll indulge me for a second, I'd like to do a little experiment. And I'm hoping you'll, you'll all participate. So I, what I want you to do is I want you to relax. You all seem pretty relaxed. I want you to sit back, close your eyes, and I want you to think of the future. A few years out, five years out, 10 years out, imagine the future. Now, if you were a visionary, I think this is the way it's done. You look to the future, and if you're looking intently enough, out comes an idea, fully formed. Did anybody experience that? Do we have some visionaries in there? A couple raise their hands. If, you've, if you are a visionary, I'm not sure why you're here. You should be home. You're, the world is waiting for your vision. Me, personally, I don't, I don't feel much like a visionary. Whenever I do that exercise, it's hard for me to imagine or not to imagine, you know, the Jetsons. I'm flying around in a spaceship somewhere or you know, I'm chasing a dog down a treadmill that's outdoors for somewhere, for some reason. Uh, so I actually don't feel much like a visionary. But what I want to do today, if I can, my mission, the change that I want to make, is I want to make each, each and every one of you a visionary. So it's going to require your participation. By the, by the time I'm done, I want each of you to be a visionary. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at an example of a visionary. Usually the visionary, this sort of lone wolf, this solitary genius. Uh, Steve Jobs is usually you know, the, the number one guy that we hold up as being this visionary. And he was an amazing entrepreneur. He really was. He changed the world. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But if we look back to 1985, Ross Perot, said this about Steve Jobs. He said, oh, you know, Steve Jobs was too poor to go to college, and he was home working in his garage, playing with computer chips, and his dad walks in. His dad says, listen, Steve, either build something that people will buy, or go get a job. And within six weeks, Steve Jobs had created the Apple computer out of a wooden box his dad gave him and he went on to change the world. I love that image. This guy really was a genius if he was able to uh, create a computer out of a wooden box. I think Perot actually missed the storyline. He should have said it was an apple crate because then the, the name would have come from the apple crate. Now that would have been a, a genius story. But anyway, it's, it, it's amusing because none of the story is true. It's the quintessential story of the visionary, but none of it's true. So what is it about the story of the visionary? The reason why he was saying that, I think, was because he was investing in Steve Jobs' next company. That was called Next. And, and Steve Jobs had left Apple, was sort of kicked out of Apple, actually. And he wanted to go create this computer company so he could realize his vision. He didn't want to be encumbered by investors, by his board of directors, by co-founders. He wanted to build this iconic computer word station that was going to change the world. And so he did. He built this amazing little box. It was in the shape of a cube. It was elegant, simple, beautiful. It belonged maybe in a design museum or an art museum, but it didn't belong in an IT data center. And so they didn't buy them. And next, the company failed. Ross Perot didn't make any money. But wait a second, he's the visionary. Why didn't he see it? Right? Or what about the iPhone? I love the iPhone. I love my iPhone. I'm passionate about the iPhone. It's an amazing device. Simple, elegant. Now, to be fair, there was a couple of decades of smartphones that pre preceded the iPhone. So Apple was able to learn a lot from that. 
But what was really world-changing about the iPhone was when they decided to open up the App Store to third-party developers. And in very quick order, thousands of applications were built, and suddenly this wasn't just a phone, it was a platform. And this platform literally wiped companies off the face of the earth virtually overnight. There were companies with business models that depended upon creating services on top of smartphones, and suddenly these developers are making it for 99 cents or offering it for free. Company's gone. Now that's what disruption looks like. What's funny about that story, though, is that Steve Jobs opposed opening up the App Store to third-party developers. But wait a second. He's a visionary. Why didn't he see it? Well, so it turns out visionaries don't relentlessly pursue their vision. True visionaries relentlessly pursue change. True visionaries relentlessly pursue change. And so I don't mean to pick on Steve Jobs. Again, I think he was an amazing man, amazing entrepreneur. But the story is, is consistent with our, our visionaries. Henry Ford stuck to his vision too long and almost killed the Ford Motor Company. Thomas Edison used to call the cub reporters in. He loved the fact he was called Wizard of Menlo Park, and he loved the myth of the visionary. And these cub reporters would come in, and the media handlers would say, you know, oh, shh, there's Thomas Edison. He's imagining the future. And Thomas Edison would literally pose so that he was imagining the future. Meanwhile, back in the lab, he had a whole team of engineers that were trying to figure out the, what, the right filament uh, for the light bulb. Uh, a, a light bulb also, by the way, that uh, Edison couldn't get a patent for at first because one uh, already existed. True visionaries relentlessly pursue change. And so, Innovation doesn't happen between our ears. Innovation doesn't happen with the solo entrepreneur. Innovation happens out in the open. Innovation doesn't happen in stealth. Innovation happens when we have collaboration, cooperation, competition. The myth of the visionary is not true. It's a story we tell. It's a narrative. Well, that's fine. We like stories. As a matter of fact, science actually tells us we like stories. So really extraordinary research being done at the Uni University of California at Santa Barbara, where they've studied these patients that have split brains, and so the left brain actually does not communicate with the right brain. And a patient's right hand will move, and they'll ask, they'll ask the, the patient, why, why did your right hand move? And inside the left hemisphere of the brain, they have this brain function called the interpreter, that will completely make up a story to explain why the right hand moved. So yes, we have this internal voice that will completely invent people, places, and things in order to make our memories make more sense, so that there's more cohesion. So that inner voice that we all know and love, weaving stories that explain the past, explain us to ourselves, explain the events of the world, and perhaps, have something to do with how we interpret the future. But so I ask, this myth of the visionary, what effect does that have on what they call this autobiographical voice? Right? So if we have the myth of the visionary, you have to be born a visionary to be a great entrepreneur, or the myth of the great writer, or the myth of the great musician or the artist, all of these things that creates this haves and the have-nots, and the haves are born this way, what does that mean for the rest of us when we're telling our little stories, our inner voice? Does that mean that I'm stuck in my job and I need to work my nine to five and I've got my inbox and my outbox? Is that, is that my life? Do I not to get to make the change that I want to see in my life? When I left college, I went and got my first job and I used to come home at night. I was, I was going, is this it? Is this my life until re retirement now? This is what it's all about? I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write the great American novel. And I remember talking to my girlfriend at the time. I go, why can't we live the life that we want to live? We should teach people to live the life that's inside of them, that we can become in control of that narrator. 
instead of whatever that auto narrator is that's hardwired into us. And so eventually, I did drop out. Grew my hair long, became scraggly, I was gonna go live the life, right? I literally left my girlfriend on a train platform crying as I was getting on the train to ride west to write the great American novel. And in between writing, I would drink, you know, this jugs of rot gut wine while reading John Steinbeck. But it turns out that living the life of the great American author actually doesn't make you a great author. I didn't really know that much uh, in my 20s, and, and the book that I wrote was, was not, a, uh, not an amazing book. But at least I led the life that I wanted to lead, right? I was the narrator. I was in charge. And so it seems like I've gone through my life in both these ways. I remember that I'm the narrator, and then there's other times where I fall back into this autobiographical self that seems to be writing the story for me. And then I remember I can be the narrator again, right? And so we can take control. We can be visionary because the true visionary relentlessly pursues change. It doesn't have to be big change. It could be changing your life. It could be changing your job. It could be creating new value for customers. Or it could be changing the world. But the size of the change that you make depends, it's directly related to how relentlessly you're willing to pursue the change. And so there's a lot of people that talk about changing the world, and they're willing to do it so or get started right after their favorite TV, TV show's done, right? And that's fine. I actually, I'm not judging. I think it can be big change or it can be small change. It just has to be your own, and it has to be honesty with yourself about what it is that you're trying to do and what you're willing to do. So it's not about doing what you're passionate about. If I did what I was passionate about, I would play sports each and every day, all day long. I'm like a Labrador. The only way I get exercise is chasing a ball. But I'm actually not good enough to get paid at it, so eventually I wouldn't be able to eat. So this isn't about being great I'm not saying you're going to be Steve Jobs. I'm not, going to say, I'm not saying you're going to be Picasso or Hemingway. Abilities vary. Timing is important. Luck is important. But we all can make change. Big change, small change. We can all make change. So it's not about doing what you're passionate about. It's about being passionate about what you do. And the way you can be passionate about what you do is by making change about doing the change that you want to see. And don't confuse the size of the step with the size of the change. I speak to entrepreneurs all the time, and I ask them, what's the big bottleneck in your company? What do you need? And they go, I need 1,000 customers. How many do you have? Zero. You don't need 1,000. You need one. Right? So it's like, it's like the dominoes. The first step is ticking over the first domino and change starts to happen. So I want to go back to our exercise and I want to try it again. So everyone, sit back, relax, close your eyes, and again, think about the future. A few years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, what change do you see? What change in the world do you see? What change in yourself do you see? What change are you willing to commit to make? And then, what is the step that you can do tomorrow? Any small step that you can do tomorrow that will start that change. So you can open your eyes. Who here has a change? Who has a step they can take tomorrow? that will start affect this change. Anyone? Anyone more than the, yes. Yes, visionaries, visionaries. Thank you very much.